Good morning. Nice to see everybody here today. Um, I'll be leading the worship service today. And I think one thing you should know before we start is that any miscues or mistakes in the service are solely the result of me not paying attention to Kevin when I should. So here you go, Kevin. Please join me in the call to worship this morning. We are children of God. As wondrous as an ocean wave, as unique as each falling leaf, united in praise, humbled in awe. Please join in our hymn of adoration, We Plow the Fields and Scatter. Holy God, like a loving father and caring mother, you watch over us and beckon us to follow the right path. But we get stuck, stopped by our fear of trying something new, trapped by our memories of past failures, caught in a web of conflicting choices, halted by the clamor of many voices. We know the distress of worry and the blur of tears. Like staring at an empty page, we feel trapped and hesitant. Free us, O God, to follow with joyful steps, to hear clearly your directions, to be bold in our loving, courageous in our caring, and brave in our speaking. Through our Lord Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day of daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our 
psalm for today is Psalm 78, verses 1 through 4. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. Things that we have heard and known that our ancestors have told us. Good morning. I'd like to take a moment for you all to greet each other now. I know a lot of you were doing that earlier, but just stand and whatever you're comfortable with, give somebody a wave and a smile. Please join in our hymn, This is the Day. Uh, we have a few announcements. Uh, first, there will be a special business meeting of the Benevolent Baptist Society immediately following the worship service next Saturday. We are. <laughs> we don't go to church on Saturday. <laughs> My apologies. There will be a Baptist Benevolent Society meeting on Sunday immediately following the worship service. I can't blame that on Kevin. <laughs> uh, we are reminded by our insurance company that we do have safety precautions due to COVID-19 and that all attendees should observe social distancing guidelines and wear proper masking or face shields. Uh, to keep with our social distancing practices, offering is collected uh, as you arrive for church and or as you depart at your convenience. Um, the property committee's been busy at work. New doors have been installed on the Jura building with new locks. Our September mission is staying here at home. Our mission is our own church. And a reminder, the Lion's Den thrift shop is still closed. Does anyone else have any announcements they'd like made?
Thanks be to thee, O God, for all good gifts, and especially for thy inexpressible gift of the Lord Jesus. Help us, O Lord, to see wherein we have been blessed and to be a blessing to others. Amen. Please join in our next hymn, Jesus, Lover of My Soul. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 7, Water from the Rock. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, and but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So my, Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with the, this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, 
Go on ahead of these people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? Join in a moment of silent meditation.
Lord God, we give you thanks for all of your gifts to us, for daily food, for health, for each breath we take, for freedom to choose, and for the gifts of your word, your power, and your love. Our hearts are truly overwhelmed, O oh God, when we consider how you have entrusted so much to us. May we be worthy of that trust. May we be people who are unafraid to live as fully and as richly as you want us to live. Help us, O oh God, as followers of Jesus, to multiply all that you have given us, to risk spreading your word and perhaps see it misunderstood, to gamble by loving those whom others think worthy only of hate, to take chances by doing good to those who have not done good to us. Help us be faith-filled and desire to increase your glory and your goodness in the world. Make us a people who share in both word and deed that which you have given us. We pray for the church gathered today both here and around the world, that it may encourage all of its members to discover, develop, and use all their gifts, those of nature and those of grace. We pray for those who are poor in body or in spirit, for those oppressed and heavy laden, for those sick or in despair. Minister by your spirit and by us to all those for whom we have prayed, and who help us walk faithfully in the path of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Join in our next hymn, Have Thine Own Way, Lord.
Our scripture text this morning comes from Psalm chapter 78, verses 1 through 4 and 12 through 16. God's goodness and Israel's ingratitude. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from, old, from of old, things that we have heard and known that our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their children. We will tell them to the coming generation and glorious deeds, the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. In the sight of their ancestors, he worked marvels in the land of Egypt. He divided the sea and let them pass through it and made the waters stand like a heap. In the daytime, he led them with a cloud and all night long with a fiery light. He split rocks open in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. He made streams come out of the rock and caused the, water to, the waters to flow down like rivers. This morning's sermon topic is called Time Out. And I thought it was interesting when Kevin sent it to me, and then I read through the sermon and found it ironic. Um, this sermon ties in parenting in the Bible. And you, most of you have known me since I was a child coming to church here and growing up. I don't have children. It's not a subject that I am well versed in. It's not even a subject I have a clue about. So, but uh, the sermon had some really interesting points. And over the years, my sisters have been kind enough and some of my friends to loan me their kids. So while I have an idea about parenting, um, I'm more biblical in this topic than actual hands-on experience. Phyllis Diller once remarked that most children threaten at times to run away from home. This is probably the only thing that parents, that keeps a parent going is that kids might run away. I'm not a parent again, um, but I understand that parenting is not for the faint of heart. Pretty quickly, that newborn bundle of joy that we all oohed and odd over in the nursery is going to grow up and have an attitude. They're going to become a handful and an aggravation and I don't know, maybe my sisters envied me a few times over the years thinking, wow, she doesn't have any kids. But parents Google a lot of information now. You can go to Barnes and Noble, you can buy books on parenting, there's whole shelves of them. Or you can do what President Harry S. Truman said. He said the key to giving advice to your children is find out what they want and then tell them they want it. I guess that kind of works. Discipline is ch of children, and keeping them on the straight and narrow is not a new thing. It's been a conversation topic in kitchens, bedrooms, classrooms, churches, even around ancient campfires since before the wheel was invented. Adam and Eve had problems with their children. You might remember Cain and Abel, what with one murdering the other. The 12 sons of Israel, you might remember the couple of them got together to try to kill the youngest one. For those Broadway bound, that was Joseph in the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Eli had evil sons, and what's more, his were so evil that his children's children were cursed for eternity. And then we have perhaps the most famous parenting dictum of all, spare the rod, spoil the child. This is a text which alone has justified the beatings of more children than we could possibly imagine. Fortunately, this phrase does not appear in the Bible, although it is miscredited to the Bible. It comes from the pen of Samuel Butler, Samuel Butler in a poem in the 17th century. Many parents believe the expression comes from the Bible because the sentiment expressed in Proverbs 13, verse 24, whoever spares the rod hates their children, but the one who loves the child is careful to discipline them. What's unfortunate is many parents believe that the rod of Proverbs 13, verse 24 is a heavy stick or a branch. It is not. The rod in this image is set squarely in an agrarian culture point of reference of that day. Shepherds always had a rod. 
if you remember your big biblical pictures. It was pretty lightweight stick with a curve on the end. The curved end was supposed to de was designed to wrap around the neck of an errant sheep as he was moving away from the herd. And this was a gentle way to bring him back in line. Because sheep are always wandering off, I guess. I don't know any more about sheep. Sure, sheep herding than I do children, by the way. The rest of the rod was used primarily as a guide to keep sheep on a path with a mere tap or a touch. Rarely would a shepherd beat a sheep. But parents in the history of child discipline have used sticks, branches, rulers, baseball bats, belts, and straps to beat children into submission. The old woodshed has become a romantic meme of a former time when a miscreant could be taught by his father the error of his ways by this simple visit to a woodshed. Hickory sticks were plentiful. Some parents, however, don't like to spank their children and they resort to other devices. It used to be that parents would send a child who was having a meltdown into a corner to stand there with their head pressed against the intersection of the two walls and where, the parent believed, the child would contemplate the wicked path on which they'd been traveling and resolve to behave in the future. Trust me, I was one of those children in the corner and I was not thinking about the path that I was on. I was thinking about getting out of the corner. Today, parents will put a child in time out so that the child has an opportunity to calm down, take a deep breath, and re-enter the world of gracious living without causing any upset or commotion. Still, many parents do not believe time out is an appropriate response. In fact, some do not believe in punishing a child at all. And one writer of a childhood text suggests all punishments are ineffective because the, the vast majority of kids don't misbehave. They behave exactly like what they are, children. It's clear that, does, that God does not share that opinion. In the scripture text for today, from Psalm 78, we see only the goodness of God. But to understand the Psalm's intent, a full reading is necessary. And when we do so, God's having none of this business of letting kids be kids. God understands that they're behaving like children, really bad children. This psalm, the second longest in the book, is a brief history of the relationship between the divine parent and his incorrigible children. The psalmist makes three major points. One, the first assertion, God treated the Israelites with love and kindness, giving them incredible blessings. As for the first assertion, the psalm says, in the sight of their ancestors, he worked marvels in the land of Egypt. He divided the sea and let them pass through it. He made the waters stand like a heap. In the daytime, he led them with a cloud and all night long with a fiery light. He split rocks open in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly from the deep. He made streams come out of the rock and caused waters to flow like rivers. So right away, the Israelites have some pretty cool blessings. They've got food, they've got reasonable good light to travel by, they're comfortable. He commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven. He rained down on them manna to eat and gave them grain of heaven. Mortals ate the bread of angels and he sent them food in abundance. He caused the east wind to blow in the heavens and by his power he, led out the, he let out the south wind. He rained flesh upon them like dust winged birds like sand of the earth of the seas. He let them fall within their camp all around their dwellings. They ate and were filled, for he gave them what they craved. God makes a case that the Israel Israelites had forgotten their patron deity, the God of their ancestors, and that as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he had been rather diligent and devoted. No one could seriously argue with this. No one could say that he had neglected them or rejected them. He had been their God and, he, and they had been his people. It's a good thing to be reminded of the goodness of God. If God were to lay out before us a list of our blessings, providential actions, compassion and kindness with which he has treated us, what would be on that list? If we're sitting in silence right now, struggling to enumerate the blessings we have come that have come to us in our life as children of God, then there's something wrong. The Psalm's second assertion 
is that the Israelites not only took the blessings for granted, but their wicked behavior insulted the God who had provided them. Now the psalmist prepares an itemized list of misdemeanors and wrongful acts by which Israelites pretty much thumbed their noses at God. They laughed and did whatever they pleased. They acted like teenagers who complain there's nothing to do and then stay up all night doing it. In spite of all this, they still sinned. They did not believe in God's wonders. They still they sinned still more against him, rebelling against the Most High in the desert, in verse 17. They tested God in their heart by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God, saying, Can God spread a table in the wilderness? They flattered him with their mouths and lied with their tongues. The, ch- the heart was not steadfast towards God. They were not true to his covenant. How often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. They tested and provoked God again and again. They did not keep in mind his power or the day when he redeemed them from the enemy, when he displayed his signs in Egypt, when he displayed his miracles in the fields. Yet they they tested Most High God and rebelled against him. They did not deserve his decrees but turned away and were faithless like their ancestors. It's a good thing to be reminded of our tendency to test God's patience, our inclination to rebel and to wander from God's care. When children behave badly, we understand they do this because they're children. Their world is quite narrow and they are the center of it. Children do not always understand that parents often act in ways the children do not understand simply because you're the grown-up and they're not. They often, they will never understand because children lack cognitive ability to understand. Mommy says this and the child has to behave. Jim Gaffigan says, toddler judgment is horrible. They don't have any. You put a 12 month on a bed and the 12 month is immediately gonna try to crawl off, usually head first on a mindless mission. But the toddler does have a mission. It's to get off the bed. They have two goals, to get off the bed and get in something else. He also says in reference to a song we're all familiar with, Morning Has Broken. I'm pretty sure my child broke it, but like everything else that they break it, if they break it, they don't admit they did it. This seems to be the case with the ancient Israelites. It's a mark of our maturity as Christians that if we understand that God is God and we are not, that God demonstrates his love for us in many different ways. Only immature Christians would display any of the behaviors mentioned previously. The third assertion, God sent numerous punishments to help shock the errant Israelites into compliance back into an appreciation of their former good fortune. Now God's reached the breaking point and he's had it because this has happened not once, not twice, but again and again. The recital of God's wrath against these children is is lengthy and it isn't pretty. But those were different days. Today, we punish children for bad behavior, although, as mentioned before, some parenting experts don't believe in punishing children Most parents do see the value of a reasonable punishment if it means to correct a bad behavior. Good parents today do not react as God did. Good parents do not get angry, do not withhold food, or do not reject their misbehaving child. A good parent continues to provide protection for that child rather than deliberately removing the protection or putting the child in harm's way. Let's be honest. The description of God's behavior in the psalm, let alone the behavior of God's children, is shocking. Psalm 78 shows God to be manic and positively abusive. And in this view of God, it is not an uncommon one in the evolving understanding of the nature of God in the ancient Old Testament. We do not understand God this way, not today. Two or 3,000 years ago, when crops failed, children died, pestilence ravaged the land, or locusts devoured the crops. 
the people of God suddenly became consciousness of their wickedness and immediately attributed their misfortunes to a God who was frankly irritated. Some suggest that we can soft pedal this image of an angry God because of a curious expression in the second verse where the writer suggests that what follows is a parable. Then too, some scholars argue that the Bible gives us a progressive revelation of the nature of God and that Jesus, and that in Jesus, God is incarnate in the true image of the truer nature of God. What we should consider, however, is in the 21st century that God still puts us in time out when we are in need of discipline. Perhaps this is an unanswerable question. If we answer yes, then we also have to conclude that God rewards us for our acts of righteousness. This in turn introduces a host of other theological questions. We don't wanna go there at least for now. But for now, it's enough to be challenged in two ways. The first, the give thanks challenge. Express gratitude for the blessings in our lives. Give thanks to God for the good things that come our way, things that God probably had nothing to do with. Give God the credit anyway. God did not give you a promotion at work. Thank God anyway. God did not give your baseball team the victory. Thank God anyway. God did not cause your crops to grow this year. Thank God anyway. God did not give you an A on your exam. Thank God anyway. God did not give you a great parking space at the mall at Christmas time, but thank God anyway. And my personal favorite, God did not move that car out of my way when I might have been driving five miles over the speed limit, but yes, I do thank God at that point. In fact, the Bible says we should give thanks in all things. God did not cause the roof to leak. God didn't give thanks to God that you at least have a house with a roof. God did not give your husband cancer. God gives thanks anyway. Give God thanks anyway and be grateful for the skillful care of the oncologist. God did not cancel the baseball season or whatever sport you're involved in. Give thanks to God for the other myriad entertainment opportunities you have. God did not cause so-and-so to say something bad about you but be grateful for the friends that you have. You see where we're going? We're giving God thanks for our friends. The second is the live right challenge. This Psalm challenges us to live in such a way that a timeout is not even on the table for discussion. In fact, rather than being timeout Christians, the Bible calls us to be time in Christians. We're called to spend time, time in serving others, time in study and prayer, time in offering our skills and talents, time in witnessing to the love of Christ, time in obedience to the world of God, time in fellowship with other believers, time in bearing the burdens of others. When we're living as time in Christians, we don't need to worry about a time out. Let's not give God a headache. Let's embrace the give thanks challenge and the live right challenge. This would be pleasing to God. Amen. Join now in our hymn of benediction, trust and obey.
before we send you forth, there is one more announcement. There will be a brief pastoral relations committee after the service today. Let us rejoice at being servants of God. Led by faith, inspired for service, and in all things consumed by joy. <laughs> 